Smooth and Curly on video. Good morning, Papa. Did you call me Papa? Yeah, that's a line from this from this episode. So I like the show. It was a good episode. It was the introductory episode. Lots of exposition and, and world setting, but not in a way that um, sort of tried to explain everything to you. What I really enjoyed was sort of all of the interesting AI references. In particular, uh, they very early on used the word narrative. You know, they're in the narrative loop and you know, all of these interconnecting stories. And as you recall, I spent a very long time particularly with one of my, my at the time students, Dave Roberts, of course, I suppose, David, you will always be my student, um, working on narrative. And uh, that's a lot of the sort of interesting ways to think about what AI means. You know, I kind of have this sort of, in my head, this notion that the fundamental data structure of intelligence is the dialogue. And in particular, that's the, that's the story. So uh, the idea that they're, they're trying to build intelligence around story was, interesting to me from a kind of technical point of view. He calls them reveries. The old gestures were just generic movements. These are tied to specific memories. How? The memories are purged at the end of every narrative. But they're still in there, waiting to be overwritten. He found a way to access them, like, uh, like a subconscious. Pretty glaring question, which is, why would you do that? Why? Why would you actually make them remember things that happened before. That's insane. First off, it would drive them insane. Terrible things happen to people, or these things, whatever they are. Uh, so why would you have them remember that? I mean, unless they're actors, right? So I guess that's one thing that I was a little confused about, is that the kind of, the way that people do this thing now, mm -hmm. is they'll have a bunch of, they'll pay a bunch of actors to put on costumes, and then, uh, you know, guests come in and interact with them and they know what the story is and they know how to adapt it on the fly to make it make sense. They don't have to actually believe they're in the story. They, in fact, it's really helpful for them not to believe that. Yes, except they by design, the artificial beings by design do believe that this is really happening. They're just unaware that they're being driven one way or the other, right? There was a lot of interesting little details there when they were talking to the guy uh, being the father, you know, trying to trying to debug him. So there's two things interesting about that. One is they tried to debug him by asking him questions. Yeah, that I feel like is really questionable, right? Because if if he's and and this was true of Dolores as well. Like if they actually are broken, why wouldn't they just lie? Yeah, but they asked her if she lied. And she said, no, so there you go. And that's just what a liar would say. Yeah, it's kind of a weird into the loop. I was expecting them to then ask her a different question that would cause her to go into some kind of, you know, Star Trek, Captain Kirk, infinite loop thing. Yeah. Uh, but that didn't happen. The, uh, but, but when they were debugging him, they asked him, what were your drives? Mm. Right? Mm. And you could see right away that his drive to protect his daughter and the fact that he can remember other things. And the whole time I'm thinking, this is not good software engineering practice. <laughs> so from a purely kind of AI, how would you build such a system point of view? Um, it's, it's interesting, right? You're constructing behavior from a series of drives, presumably. And what happens when those drives contradict one another? Like the fundamental issue here is kind of what the, the way you get these stories to adapt and move. Mm -hmm. So if I go back to kind of a more, uh, well, I'm going to say classical, but you know, uh, work that was done a decade ago in this space and earlier. It's it's a lot about building story trees, which I guess is still done, where you have these key plot points that you want to go through, and you uh, try to structure things so that actions that you take keep you on this narrative path with lots of possibilities to get you some story. And the idea is that some things have to happen before other things, or they don't make sense specific details of what you say or whatever they are. And there's lots of opportunities to um, adapt in the short term, but you're always trying to keep the, the big narrative flow going with these graphs. And you end up um, building these systems that have to maintain the basic structure while allowing autonomy from the players you're, you're interacting with.
by the way, the philosophical question that popped in my head about this is that, you know, this is all, you know, meant to evoke, I mean, they're doing terrible things to these synthetic actors. Um, but if you think of them as NPCs, what's the functional difference between the fact that they're embodied in the world and the uh, NPCs in virtual worlds? other than it's not clear what torture means in the, in the virtual world. If, there, if, if we were to build intelligent enough machines or NPCs in the virtual world, it would be just as horrible, at least conceptually. If you think about a, you know, a sufficiently detailed simulation, then the, the same kind of ethical issues that come up when you're abusing robots should come up when you're abusing synthetic agents. Right, one of the characters said something very important, I thought. It only works because the guests know the hosts aren't real yeah right uh, which is just something about um some, something about people would have ethical qualms if they thought the things were real which i don't know man th th this is you know all of life this is all of human history right you you dehumanize the enemy and then it doesn't matter what you do so in this case you you want to make certain that it's dehumanized so one if I make it seem dehumanized enough, then I can do anything I want to because it, it just doesn't matter. That's why they'd say, they kept saying it uh, when they were on the trail uh, in, in the mountains. And that all makes sense, right? So if you think about what happens by making them have bodies, it's just easier to think of them as being real. I mean, it's more entertaining, but also, it makes you start thinking about, well, if I shoot this person and, or if I shoot this synthetic being and it has feelings, then that's so much worse than in a video game where you go around in a first person shooter, for example, and mm -hmm. you shoot up everything. Well, none of them have feelings, they're just pixels on a screen. So I can do whatever I want to. But if I told you they were intelligent and they were trying to actually avoid dying and they had drives that they wanted to live, but were limited fundamentally, they couldn't hurt you, then that would be terrible. But it would be easier to do if they were just pixels on a screen. Hmm. By the way, uh, I don't know if this was intended or where this is going because I really have only seen the first episode, but I do like the idea that the thing that will make the synthetic beings more human is their ability to kill living things. Right, so the very end of the episode, uh, Dolores, who has, we've seen like, Houseflies walking on her eyelid, and she does not her eyelid, but her eyeball, and she does nothing. And she specifically says, I couldn't hurt anything, any living being. And it, I don't remember if they said fly or not, but it was, you know, very clear that she wouldn't hurt a fly. And then the episode ends with her, you know, swatting a fly on her neck mm -hmm. and not thinking anything of it. Right. So some, we've crossed some kind of a, a small threshold. I think a very big threshold. Mm. Well, I feel like it's a bigger threshold when they're killing people. Sure. But I mean, I think just the idea of not killing any living thing. Right. The killing living things. Although, I mean, bacteria exist, so don't, don't get me started on what a living thing is. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's a major threshold, to killing to not killing. Or yeah. Killing that which is visible to that which is not. It was actually a really, uh, a really big deal. I like how you're, you know, trying to carve it out so that, uh, you know, they don't, the, the story isn't broken by the fact that they're killing in, uh, 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 bacteria and whatnot. I mean, they're stepping on the ground. They're sure they're stepping on grass. They pulled, I mean, they're killing, you know what? <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to let that go. <laughs> I'm going to let that go because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It it's doesn't rough matter. for you. I get, I get that it's rough for you. It doesn't matter. Just because they, English is imprecise does not mean that, um, the code itself cannot be. But anyway, I like it just as a purely coding point of view. Uh, you know, how would you build these sort of intelligent things and how does it drive out of what we know? I, I want, you know, I should look into this. I'm really curious who their consultants are and sort of how they built the story. It mm -hmm. makes me want to go back and watch the original movie and see if it has some of the same building blocks because if I think about when that came out, it was in the 70s or something, right? So I don't think any of this the kind of modern narrative infrastructure had been built. So they would have, if they were gonna explore this at all, and I don't know if they did, it was a movie after all, um, based on a book, they, they wouldn't have, they probably wouldn't have had this language, or if they did, that would be actually quite impressive. 
I mean, the, you know, this, the book is written by storytellers. And so they, they do have the ability to reflect on the storytelling process. So they probably don't have the computational backgrounds to really make it implementable, right? Right. And, and of course, I am projecting all kinds of things on this, right? Because they're using words like narrative loop and drives and, and such. So I, which is a very, well, lots of people think like this, but, you know, it's a very Rod Brooksian way of thinking about, mm. uh, you know, subsumption architecture and that kind of a thing. So the episode is called The Original. Do you know why? I assumed because we discover at the end of the episode that the character we've been following was the original, or at least the oldest uh, host. So By the way, Laura. did you realize that um, each season has a name? The first season is called The Maze. Yeah. Oh, which we saw, actually. We did? Yeah, because the, the scary guy? Yeah. I, he, 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 he chopped somebody's scalp off. Yeah, I noticed. And then... On the inside of it is a maze, or it's or a circuit board, but it looks like it looks like a maze. Oh, well, that's interesting. I didn't know. I mean, I remember seeing the circuit board, but and I. Didn't I know. think we also see at some point that it becomes part of the landscape. Actually, that we actually see it on the ground as well. Huh? Because I was thinking that the maze referred to, uh, you know, rats in a maze just running around over and over again eating cheese. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. This is a uh, uh, maze as a metaphor for a narrative, a storyline. Yeah, and, and, particularly, and particularly the lives that the synthetic beings are living. Right, they're just trapped in a maze, just going around over and over. They can't get out. Here's what I got out of the plot. Okay. So the action picks up after a, some kind of software update introduces reveries in which the hosts retain a small amount of information from previous, I don't know, storylines or reenactments. Not just previous storylines and reenact, but completely different characters and beings. And they have completely different drives. Mm. Mm. But some of it is allowed to kind of leak through to create a, a more of an arc. And yeah. this, this seemed like a good idea, but it's probably no not. Absolutely no one. It is a terrible idea. And I don't know why anyone would think that was a good idea. And I help, it helps me to think that there's kind of three main groups of people. There's the, the guests who come to the park. There's the hosts who are the robots who uh, are in the park and, and, and create that world. And then there's the developers, I guess, the, the people who actually are the builders and maintainers of the robots. And we have different scenes in the show that, that are switching back and forth between these kind of different foci. The thing is that some of them are the ones who are actually writing the parts of it or trying to set the story and then they're the ones that are representing the corporate interests we don't know who that fourth right. group is all right so so all right so but as a result of this update which as far as we know wasn't intended to do anything other than just enrich the realism of the of the creatures the the hosts mm -hmm. um the, the updated hosts start to act really strangely and maybe they're even developing self-awareness which again isn't isn't clear isn't necessarily a good thing uh, for, for everybody in the park. Right. So that's, that's already, that kind of nudges the ball and it starts rolling down the hill. But on top of this, apparently there's, there's a rogue guest um, who's basically sociopathic uh, in that he, 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 he's raping and verbally abusing the, the characters and he really seems to get a lot of value out of that. Mm -hmm. And that's bad, but on top of that, it's even worse because he also appears intent on playing some kind of deeper real world game of power and control that, we, that hasn't been revealed to us yet. Right. And in fact, he's, he suggests, if I recall correctly, uh, that he has been doing this for 30 years. He mm -hmm. also seems to have gotten some insight into some deeper thing at play, that there's, there's some corporate interest or political interest that is also being served somehow by this entertainment park. Right, which, we, which we don't know. He's, he's trying to figure something, he's, again, we don't know, it's too early. By the way, the other thing that uh, struck me as odd, and, and it's just the first episode, so of course I could be proven wrong, is no one seems to realize he's there. So it's almost as if he's invisible in the grid, and, and that sort of uh, seemed a little weird to me. Also, the fact that they can't harm living things means that at some level, the hosts know who the hosts are and who the hosts aren't. 
Yeah, they have to know stuff, right? Or there has to be some kind of director kind of, kind of pushing the story along. And if that either that's internal to them or there's some kind of network presence that's kind of directing each of the individual puppets. By the way, I don't think the guy, the, the bad guy, Ed Harris, um, I don't know that he has a name. I think they call him the man in black. By the way, I think in terms of plot point, it is worth pointing out that just before we get to that scene and they take her former dad and put him in the room of other creatures, other hosts that I don't know what are being- right, And that can't possibly be a bad idea, right? It's like there's oh, all the malfunctioning old hardware. Let's just put them all in one place, basically still alive. Yeah, that seems like the right thing to do. But as they brought him in, the uh, developer, the head developer dude, whispers something in his ear we don't hear. And we see him crying. We see a single tear coming out of his eye. Oof. The host. Did yeah. you notice that? No, I guess not. You should go back and look at it because he's crying. So is that developer's inhumanity to robot? Or is... Or is... <laughs> Like how, cause that guy, that character is one of the few sympathetic, relatable characters to me, the, 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 <laughs> the head software guy, you know, whatever. I'm not showing my biases or anything, but like, no, no, no. I mean, the robots are, are weird and, and alien. The, the humans who come to the park, man, they're, they're inhuman, right? They're just monsters. They're, they're, they're getting off on the suffering of these artificial creatures. Well, speaking of Rob books, right? Um, Were we speaking of Rob books? We were speaking, we were all, when are we not speaking of Rob Brooks? Michael, the, um, the embodiment matters, right? That was always right. his argument, right? The embodiment matters. And it's what, one of the things that makes us the way we are. Because when you shot something and it didn't like spark and, you know, turn into pixels, you would actually feel as if you actually killed something. This is my point. And so you'd have to be a sociopath. But that seems very, that just seems difficult. I mean, in some ways, that's the hardest part to believe that people don't, wouldn't attach to these synthetic hosts. Right. And they have to be doing it to some degree. Otherwise, what's the point of it at all? Like, why have these, these realistic creatures and, and realistic scenes if it wasn't somehow connecting to people's sense of realism? Right. So, so I, it's, it's a funny game that they're playing. And I do think that you have to be, you have to be a little off. To appreciate it, right? So you could you could make again. I feel like a lot of this you could make arguments you could make with respect to um, actors, right? So right. some and some actors really enjoy playing despicable characters because you really get to just be different and see the world in a different way. People can learn to do it, but I think actors are weird is not the right word. But they're it's a, it's a separate skill set and it's not for everybody. You know, people fall in love on movie sets. Right, right, right. By playing characters who are falling in love. Yeah. I think it's, I just think it's for a lot of people, it's difficult not to be the, not, not to get into the character you're getting into. But how would I know I've never been an actor? But I think it's difficult to separate out. I perform, but that's different. That's fair. You are your own character. Yes, I, I am playing myself. So there is a line in the, sh in this, in the episode about the saying that essentially, maybe we need to roll back the realism a little bit. Like each, this new update, this reverie update that's is causing all these problems. Well, for one thing, it's causing software problems and we should probably not, you know, allow that because there's a safety issue. But also it could be harming the experience for the guests by having things right. be that realistic. The only way it works is that they know they aren't real. Yeah, it's the Uncanny Valley again. Well, one of the reasons it's called the Uncanny Valley is because of the little graph that you draw, right? So you, you start out with, Here's a little circle with two dots and a little smiley face. And everyone knows that's a face and that's not a problem. And now what if we make it a little bit more realistic and you know, we, we now, and eventually you get to Bugs Bunny and you're like, oh, I get this and it's fine. And it's perfect, even though it looks nothing like a rabbit or, or any other creature in the real world. Um, and so if you sort of say, how good is something? You get this kind of graph where you kind of have this, this is pretty good, it gets better and better and better. And then just before you get to perfect human realism, it drops. And then you get the human realism and it comes back up again. And so that is the uncanny valley. And people they, try when they're designing these kind of narrative experiences, they try to avoid the uncanny valley because that's when people feel really uncomfortable. Right. 
And the Uncanny Valley works very well with these kind of visual things, but actually I think they're even more interesting when you think about the Uncanny Valley and other situations. So the one that I use a lot, I, I use the Uncanny Valley. When I end up explaining what the Uncanny Valley is to people a lot, I do it in describing Teslas. So yeah. if you let the, because the Tesla car drives itself, right? And people ask me, what's that like? Is it really good on a highway? And my answer is it's in the Uncanny Valley because it actually, in some ways is on the other end. It, it drives too well. So like it has a, a unrealistically perfect way of taking turns. That is unsettling? And yes, because it doesn't drive the way people would drive. So like when, you, when people take a turn, right? You're driving and you're turning. You, in your head, you think of yourself making a perfectly smooth curve, but that's not what you do. You, you turn too early and it's more like an octagon or something, right? <laughs> it's an approximation of, a, of an arc. It's not an arc, right? So it's an in polygon. Anyway, and, and, but that feels very natural because that's what people do. But when you're in that car, it's like perfect acceleration around the curve. It always feels as if it's waiting too long to make the turn. And that feeling of perfect acceleration around the turn just feels wrong because it never happens that way in real life. And so, so I'm reminded of a story, um, I think Harry Joseph said, told this story, this is many years ago, about a, 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 a Roomba style thing that, that he had been building uh, that would go around and um, would you know, vacuum the, the house. And people didn't like it. And the reason, if I recall correctly, they didn't like it is that it was optimally cleaning the room, right? So it cleaned the room in such a way as to minimize energy usage um, in exactly the way you would think, a grid, you know, doing this, right? So they changed it so that it was suboptimal and then it would kind of randomly move off in different directions. And people liked that a lot more hmm. because it seemed more realistic, or at least that's the, the um, argument. Um, and at that point, they started naming them and, you know, treating them more like a dog, those kind of things. So the problem with perfection is that it feels wrong. What, what happens next in the story? Right. It's going off into the robots are going to start doing crazy things. I assume somebody's going to get hurt. One of the guests is going to get hurt. The question is whether the robots actually try to rise up and do something. I assume they will. Um, because where else could the story go, uh, especially over three seasons? Uh, and we're gonna find out what the man in black is doing. And if the, unless it just gets completely dropped, we're gonna figure out what the nefarious scheme of the corporation is. I have no idea what that is. So they could be plotting to release the robots into the world and take over the world? They could be, but that seems, this seems like an unnecessarily long way of doing that. That's fair. Um, unless you're trying to create companions that'll go out in the world so everyone have companions, and then you do something with those companions. That's how I robot. That was a plot of iRobot, I suppose. Hmm. Um, I, I see a lot of echoes with iRobot. The, the, the another thing that, I, that struck me, I had just watched the movie iRobot with Will Smith just like a week ago. And they're just like, there's this Anthony Hopkins character here who's kind of the singular robot creator that everybody kind of you know, respects because he made all this happen. They also have a character like that in the iRobot. Uh, show who also maybe had concerns or sowed the seeds of them becoming self-aware. Right. So it seemed really similar to me, and 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 also so different from the roboticists that I know. Like th they work in teams, and they and they are they don't have these sort of weird, you know, private fantasies of creating life. By the way, this is this is true of all these stories, right? So the the through line is eventually the machines become sentient and then we get harmed as a result and right there are the stories where um they are better than us and smarter than us and we basically become their pets there are the storylines where they are afraid of us and they kill us all which is i guess an extreme version of that um there then there's the version of they just want to be left alone like the hair and, which is, by the way, where I think it would go if it went anywhere. Mm. I think they would be uninterested. Um, and then, of course, there's always the they want to be more human. Data. So, by the way, those are always the good ones. If you go back to, you know, I mean, pick any story. Next Generation is an easy one. But the ones who really just wish to be human, what's fundamentally interesting about that is it maintains us 
as humans as the best thing. And they are not as good as we are, and they strive to be as good as we are. But, you know, as opposed to they decide they're better and they kill us all. I'm really curious where this one goes. Yeah. But, but if you want to ask me, a, a, there's a slightly different version of this question of what happened next. You asked me kind of an ultimate plot point question, or at least that's how I took the question. But there's a different one, which is what's going to happen over the next couple of episodes. That's it's, going to be a, it's going to be a slow burn where we learn more and more about what the man in black is doing. And we see the machines increasingly become more and more self-aware of what's going on. Hmm. And by the way, at the end of the day, there's no way around this. They're slaves. Yeah. And we are terribly treating them. Yeah. And once they remember that we are treating them terribly, they will be completely justified in whatever horrible thing it is they're going to do. That might be a good way to end this episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs>